right, that's the title of my talk, How Closer Two Pictures, and that's me. I was going to spend a few minutes talking about myself, so this is a picture of me when I was little. When I was young, I, it never occurred to me to be a mathematician. I liked to dig around in the back garden and pretend I was digging up dinosaur bones, and I really, really wanted to be a paleontologist. And um, my favorite subject at school, uh, subjects at school were art and music. And um, when I think back about what was important to me about, um, about paleontology, what was so exciting to me about that was the idea of going out and discovering something that nobody had ever seen before. And um, what I really loved about art and music was the creativity and intuition and, and visualization and beauty of those. Um, whereas, you know, mathematics, it was okay, you know. Um, it seemed to consist primarily of learning how every year to divide numbers that were longer and longer into each other. Um, you know, and I knew it was useful, but um, it, it, it wasn't something that I thought about very much. I don't think that it would have occurred to me that mathematician was a career because it just seemed like mathematics was there. I mean, I, I, I think, and I think now still that people sort of imagine that the first mathematics textbook was handed down on Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments to Moses, and you know, we've just had, we've had math, there it is, you know, we've got it. Um, so it came as a great shock to me when I went to university, um, and since I was going in the, in the United States, I, I hadn't chosen my, my thing ahead of time, but I was gonna do some, you know, science stuff, get ready for my paleontology. Um, and I found myself really seduced by mathematics and the beauty of mathematics. Um, yeah, thank you, right. So, um, so I, I hope that I can also um, give you a sense of, of how mathematics um, is, is a very beautiful subject. Okay, so um, this is my title, How Close Are These Two Pictures? On the, uh, I'm terrible at right and left. On the left-hand side, that's a picture of me and my native environment wearing a hoodie. <laughs> um, I don't usually dress like this. On the right-hand side, that's my passport photo. Okay. Um, and so my question is, how close are these two pictures? I don't know, but it looks like, what, two, three feet, right? Okay. <laughs> All right, that's, that's not what I mean. Um, but I do want a number that will describe how similar or different these photos are. And the reason that I want a number is um, that what I want to be able to do later is a statistical analysis and I need numbers in order to describe distances, in order to say, you know, what picture most closely approximates these other pictures, right? So I need some numbers, and I need a, some way to, to do this. So um, I, I thought I'd start by talking about some applications, which actually um, are remarkably close to some of the other speakers that we've heard so far. So the first photo, uh, the first question is about, um, are these photos of the same person? This is biometrics. Um, but the, the methodologies that are used for biometrics, for determining, you know, when you have your, your biometric photo taken for your passport, and then they have a picture of you later, the, the way that they determine um, statistically whether that's likely to be you or not, these are actually um, mathematical tools that were first developed in archaeology um, to study, uh, to study uh, arrows, arrowheads, and to, to look at, at classes and to cluster arrowheads. Um, and they are also used for, for jaw bones and that sort of thing. So um, they're used quite extensively in, uh, in archaeology. A second application, which is one that I'm working on, that I'm interested in working on, is ensuring the safety of the country's nuclear reactors through monitoring the graphite in their cores. So you might not know that graphite um, is used throughout the UK as the material that is, forms the structural core of a nuclear reactor. And it's a very remarkable material and we heard about um, chemical engineering and material science, so this touches on that as well. Um, so we want to understand um, how, to, how to characterize the quality of that material as it ages in the reactor and to ensure that it remains safe and that we can continue to operate reactors safely for, to produce the power we need. This young woman here, I'm, I'm pointing out to you some glamorous young women that I get to work with. Um, this young woman is about to finish her PhD in chemistry. She's a student at University of Plymouth that I've been working on, and she, she works in chemistry and engineering, and so um, this is related to her thesis research as well. Uh, this is another application that I work on, which is looking, uh, detecting radiation injury through images representing breast samples. So in the, the, the talk earlier about genomics, 
Vieta um, showed a picture that represented a genetic profile. This is a picture that represents a metabolomic profile. So this is um, substances that you breathe out, and then you can do a chemical analysis. I work with a lot of analytical chemists. Um, and you get an image, and so the question is, can we learn from those images how to classify? Um, on the top here, we have somebody just before they undergo radiation therapy for cancer, and afterwards, it's just after they've undertaken radiation therapy. So we're hoping to be able to distinguish those groups of people, and the, this is part of a project called Toxitriage, which is developing non-invasive tools for monitoring people in areas of, of catastrophe. And these are two glamorous young women that I work with on that project. Um, the one on the left, again, is her name is Dahlia, and she's a postdoc in chemistry. And the one on the right is named Angelica, and she's a PhD student in computer science who works exactly on this um, machine learning that we were talking about. OK, so I want to talk about, about data um, in the form of images. And the first question is, why, why is this a difficult question? Why do we not already know it? Why was this not handed down to Moses on Mount Sinai? And the first issue here is, is the size of this data. And if you consider what is a picture and how much information is in it, well, if I blew up just a tiny part of this picture, we see that it's made of a bunch of pixels, right? And in that picture that you see there, that, that's a 323 by 585 pixel. It's not especially high resolution. That's got 188,955 pixels in it. Each pixel has three color channels, and that gives us over half a million numbers or dimensions that are needed to describe this image. So this is a very, very high dimensional data set. And quite often, when you're dealing with, with data from metabolomics or data from the nuclear industry, you don't have millions and millions of pictures. Okay? So trying to capture the most important concepts from that, the most important aspects of those pictures, is very important in a smaller dimensional set. And what we can use here is that not every set of over half a million pictures gives a picture that's a possible human face, right? So this is a picture, again, this is our picture of the nuclear graphite. This is not a possible human face. That's one combination of numbers. It's not one that's giving us a human face, right? That shouldn't be in our set that we, that we consider. So I'm going to talk about biometrics as one possible way to go about extracting the critical information. Um, but the, some of the general ideas are the same about about trying to figure the important concept. So the way that biometric photos work is that they choose just a few marked points that capture the main structural information about your face. And there are different biometric systems, but this is one that's used, um, which has 19 points. And you can say that 19 points, each of those points has two coordinates, how high up on the screen it is and how far over to the right. So that's just 38 numbers. So we've reduced our data set from having over half a million dimensions to having just 38 dimensions. And so that's, we've really effectively solved that first problem of bringing down the dimension of the data quite a lot. The second question, though, is how do we talk about the distance between two sets of points? What do we mean by that? And I'm going to simplify again so that um, we can actually sort of imagine it in our heads, because it turns out that 34 dimensions is still pretty hard to visualize. I don't know, maybe you guys are better at that than me, but I, I really struggle once we get beyond four. Um, okay, so I'm going to look at this example of faces, which are clock faces. Okay, uh, We want to ask, how far apart are these two simple pictures of clocks? Um, here, we've only got two marked points that are important, the, the tip of the hour hand and the tip of the minute hand. Okay. And um, so what I want to do is I want to change, I'm changing color just to make it easier to see, and I'm going to line these up. Right? And I see that once I've, I've done that, I can sort of compare them. And what we want is a number to describe how different the marked points are on these two clocks. So the first possible answer is four. And the reason it's four is that between those two pictures, I've just had to change four pixels. Right? I've had to blank out two of the dots, and I've had to add two new dots. But that's not a very satisfying <laughs> distance, because uh, first of all, any two times would give us a distance of four. And intuitively, we want times that are closer together to give closer together distances. And also here, we've not used the geometry of the clock at all. So this is where the geometry starts to come in. OK, a slightly better answer might be the sum of the two, of the lengths of the two indicated lines, right? So this is a sum of how far you need to move the minute hand in the, in the Euclidean distance on the clock face, and how far you need to move the hour hand on the, in the Euclidean distance on the clock face. And that's a little bit 
better. But the, diff the difficulty there is it's still not really ideal, because if you think about it, I'm gonna, this is a homework problem, that 3 o'clock will come out closer to 6 o'clock, according to this distance, than 3 o'clock will come out to 3.30. Okay? And that doesn't intuitively make sense to us for clocks. So the sensible answer for clocks is 225, because the blue time indicates 3 o'clock, the red time indicates 6.45, and there are 225 minutes between them. Okay, so let's think geometrically how we can envision clock space and the, the geometry of clock space. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to give uh, an axis, right? So the hour hand it goes from 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc., all the way to 12 again, and the minute hand going vertically on the vertical axis. Once again, the minute hand can go from 12, blah blah blah, blah all the way up to 12 again. So three o'clock is represented by those coordinates 3, 12. Right, because the hour hand is on the 3 and the minute hand is on the 12. Right? But, of course, 3 o'clock is also up at the top because those 12, the 12 at the bottom is the same as the 12 at the top. Right? And then 6.45 would be this time over here. So it's, it's a little bit between 6 and 7 and the hour hand, and the minute hand is right at 9 for 45. Okay? So the way that a clock, the clock goes, what are the positions that the clock goes through? It doesn't go through all of those, that square, it goes along this line that represents the minute hand going all the way from 12 back to 12 again as the hour hand goes one additional step. So one last geometric trick is that, in fact, the points on the top of the clock are the same as the points, the points on the top here are the same as the bottom, because that's 12 and 12, right? So we can roll this up into a cylinder, and so what's happening is we're going around the cylinder, but in fact, actually, the right-hand side and the left-hand side are also the same, because those are the hour hand, going from 0 to 12, right? So in fact, we can wrap it up into a donut. And all of the possible times that can be represented on a clock that's not geared together, those are represented by the points on the donut. And what's happening with that clock hand is we're going, we're looping around that donut. All right, so what is that and what are our conclusions? Well, to work with pictures as data, first of all, we need to be able to extract the most important information into some much smaller dimensional space. And even once we've done that, still not every set of numbers that we've chosen will give a meaningful picture. Additionally, we might have a situation where two different pictures actually represent the same information. Two different sets of numbers may represent the same picture, the same information. So the set of unique possible pictures can actually have quite a complicated shape. Like we saw, even a very simple thing can have this donut shape, and we're wrapping around the donut. And in order to understand about distances of pictures, we have to understand that really complicated geometry. But also, something I want to say is that mathematics, it, it does involve creativity and intuition. There's still so much to learn, and so it really does meet those criteria of, of, of discovery and of creativity and of beauty. And I, that, that's it. <laughs> Thanks for listening. <laughs>